Welcome to Amen Practice, where we explore the multifaceted world of wellness and the unique journeys of those who dedicate their lives to it. I'm your host, Jess Reynolds, and you know, sleep has always been a pivotal part of my personal wellness routine and something I emphasize very heavily in my work. It's fascinating. I've always believed it to truly be the cornerstone of health. In fact, my Elements of Health program, sleep is the very first thing we address. So I'm particularly excited about today's conversation. Today I'm joined by Mary McLeod. She's a sleep researcher and expert in sleep studies who brings a wealth of knowledge and experience, especially in the realm of cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia, which is something I didn't even know was a thing and is really cool. Mary's journey from focusing on benzodiazepine use to developing holistic non-drug methodologies for improving sleep is a truly enlightening conversation and it's also super inspiring. And in this conversation, we dive deep into how cognitive behavioral techniques can truly revolutionize sleep quality and the fascinating biology of sleep and practical tips for improving sleep hygiene. Mary will also share her insights into pediatric sleep, which is one of her areas of specialty and it's a growing area of interest and importance. So now, as we dive into the mysteries of sleep and discover its profound impact on our overall being, I invite you to join me on this enlightening journey with Mary McLeod. So before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to introduce our sponsor, Jane, a clinic management software and EMR with a human touch. Whether you're switching your software or going paperless for the first time, the Jane team knows that the onboarding process, well, it can feel a little bit overwhelming. That's why with Jane, you don't just get a software, you really do get a whole team. Included in every Jane subscription is their award-winning customer support. Now, a lot of places will say award-winning customer support, but they really are amazing. And they're available by phone, email, and chat whenever you need, even Saturdays. You can also book a free account setup consultation to review your account and ensure you feel super confident about going live. And if you'd like some extra advice along the way, you can tap into the lovely community of practitioners, clinic owners, and front desk staff through Jane's community Facebook group. It's a solid group. So if you're interested in making the switch to Jane, head to jane.app slash switch to book a one-on-one -on -one demo with a member of their support team. And if you choose to make the switch, don't forget to mention my code, which is AIM one M O that's a I M the number one M O at the time of sign up for a one month grace period on your new Jane account. Well, Mary, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with me. Our mutual friend, Jerry introduced us and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Sleep is, is a fairly big part of my own personal practice. It's a big part of uh, some of the workshops I do, and I've, I've found it absolutely fascinating to study and learn more about and, and genuinely believe, you know, I actually have this program I call Elements of Health, where I go through the elements of health that I think a person needs in order to be healthy. And I go through it sequentially in what I believe most important to least. Number one is sleep. So even within my, my programs of education, I start with sleep. So I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about this again. Welcome. And if uh, if you'd like to, we can begin by just uh, talking a little bit about you. What what got you into sleep studies in particular? From my understanding, you you work or study with children as well. So uh, so fill me I, in. What what brought you to where you're at? I do. I um, it wasn't a linear path for me, uh, as for most people, I guess these days it wasn't a straight trajectory. So when I went back to graduate school, I, I was uh, focused on uh, drug use, uh, particularly benzodiazepine use that was being used in uh, significant quantities. And I was looking at big data sets um, and the amount of drug that was being prescribed. And so that's where I initially started. And as I dug into that research, what I found was um, this was uh, in the 90s. And what I found was not only was the prescription rate high, but there was an alternative. 
to the prescription. And there was a, at that time, a fairly new methodology that a non-drug method that was being uh, studied, promoted, and was having excellent results. <clears throat> and it was cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia. And so that redirected my focus because at the time there wasn't a lot of work being done in that area. And so that's where I started uh, focusing my, my own interests and in research because the fewer drugs that were prescribed, um, you know, the fewer consequences of those drugs being consumed were not only, you know, in, in terms of the actual cost, but health costs to individuals. And I was at that time looking particularly at seniors. And so, you know, falls uh, that are associated with, with multiple drug uh, interactions were uh, top of mind at the time. And there really, really wasn't much in the way of programs available for seniors who uh, might be interested in coming off uh, benzodiazepine, for example, um, uh, and looking at something that is more holistic, like the cognitive behavioral treatment. So uh, actually, with um, uh, one of my colleagues, we developed a program that we piloted uh, in cognitive behavioral treatments, a uh, group program at the time, and the results were really um, fascinating because we had we didn't require people who were coming into the program to come off the benzodiazepines or, or any drugs, but we found that people who came into the program, about 80% of them came off the benzodiazepines on their own. Oh. Um, and that the improvement in their sleep, both the time that it took to go to sleep, we call that sleep onset, the time, number of times that they would awaken and the amount of time that they'd be awake during the night uh, decreased. Um, mm. And the time that they actually spent in solid sleep uh, increased. So uh, not only did that happen, but those results were sustained for a significant period of time. When we looked at them six months out, uh, those results were still in place. And so um, the idea was that we would pilot it and then it would be uh, um, launched into through the community health nurses so that we would be able to look at uh, making it accessible. Mm -hmm. That was the first uh, um, sort of collapse of the, of the regionals uh, health and uh, we went to a different system and so that program actually fell by the wayside. Mm. Um, I ended up doing a bit of a uh, a 90 degree turn and ended up taking on a role at uh, at Hodgkin's Brain Institute in addictions and and mental health and coordinating the research program, first research program there at that time. Huh. And then we had our children and um, you know interestingly my first uh, child uh, had a hard time falling asleep on her own even though I had studied sleep. And by nine months, I was thinking, I can't believe that my own kids aren't sleeping well. So uh, I, we, that, that diverted me into pediatric, uh, hmm. more looking at pediatric sleep and uh, diving more into that area. And uh, so that's how I got, that's how I became interested in pediatric sleep and, and currently am, um, I work with clients, but I also am the director of research for the Family Sleep Institute, which teaches uh, uh, pediatric sleep to practitioners. And uh, it's a global it's a global program um, for sleep consultants and counselors. Uh, we have, you know, physicians, uh, social work. It, it, we have all every variety because uh, I think, as you mentioned, sleep is something that transects all practices and is important. And so um, um, I did my training, uh, pediatric training, sleep training with the Family Sleep Institute for Met, and now I'm uh, looking, working with them uh, doing research. So we do global research. Um, this, we just finished a second 
research study the, the data has just been collected and we're just initially starting the analysis uh, and that I need to know. Uh, this, the, the first research project was, um, again, sort of a pilot to see what other areas we wanted to dive into. And the second one, we're going to be focusing more on cultural differences uh, mm -hmm. uh, across the globe. And we have, we have 400 and 450 different uh, uh, individuals who submitted data uh, across the world. Um, and so, you know, upwards of 30 countries that have participated. So we're in a unique position because we, we are so um, internationally based that we mm -hmm. have our ability to collect that kind of information. So looking forward to getting and diving into that, digging into that data a little more. See, yeah. uh, you know, just on the preliminary uh, look, there was there's some interesting things there. So, yeah, that that'll be the the work over the next little while is looking at what those differences are. Okay. Thank you. I mean, like you said, <laughs> not not a not a straight path, but um, no, no, I find no. that very very few paths are I I've uh, seen so far, man. There's there's a few things that came up that I'm quite curious to discuss, and I'm not too sure where to dig in first. But I mean, the the CBT, the cognitive behavioral techniques that you were talking about, that 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 holds a lot of interest uh, for me because a lot of the the clients, I adult clients, right? I don't work with the children, of course, experience the same thing: either sleep onset issues or or waking up periodically throughout the night issues with that. And um, I'm actually not very familiar. Like I, I know the CBT protocol very well, but I'm not familiar how one would use it for sleep. So I'm curious to kind of go down that avenue. But simultaneously, I'm also very curious to talk about uh, pediatric sleep issues. So um, perhaps we can sort of go in both of these directions one at a time. And if it's okay with you, could we could we talk first a little bit about um, using cognitive behavioral techniques or cognitive behavioral therapies in adults and what was the procedure that you have used and found useful uh, to to help adults either fall asleep in a, in a, a more uh, I guess ideal span of time, or if it's useful for individuals who wake up periodically through the night and want to fall back asleep. So, you know, cognitive behavioral uh, treatment for insomnia in particular has. Um, it's very, it's, it, the methodology is fairly, has been very well documented, it's fairly prescribed. And, um, you, know, you know, one of the um, leaders uh, in that area is, is Dr. Moran, who is actually Canadian out of uh, Quebec, uh, who was the first one to introduce that uh, program and use cognitive behavioral treatment uh, as, a, as a bedrock. So. Uh, you know, it's it's foundational in, of course, uh, first principles would be sleep hygiene. Um, so making sure, uh, I mean, I don't think most people are familiar with that. Um, it would be timing, temperature, environment. So creating an environment and um, that's conducive to sleep. Uh, Making sure the bedroom is decluttered and doesn't have any electronics in it, for example, is dark, um, is noise free, as noise free as it can be. Uh, if there is noise in that, uh, disruptive noise is masked. Uh, and temperature is really important for sleep, so making sure that it's really cool. Um, sleep onset only happens when our body temperature drops. If it's too warm, then sleep onset doesn't happen. So that's that's kind of the first layer. Uh, and there's other things that are incorporated into that when I work with somebody that would include hydration, for example, because that uh, has an impact on hormones. Um, um, so um, yeah, hydration and hygiene and and then we start working on some relaxation techniques to incorporate into the street. Not all cognitive behavioral treatments do that initially, but I like to start with that, those three things. And then we look at uh, things that are arousal mechanisms. So um, that would be noise. That would be making sure that 
we consume our meals at appropriate times, making sure that we get outdoor uh, activity, uh, making sure that we get daylight. Um, so setting some of those things in place, um, sleep's very contingent. Your night's sleep is very contingent on what you do first thing in the morning. If you, if you don't start first, start off right, it's going to, you're going to have a more difficult time falling asleep at night. So, um, we can talk a little bit more about melatonin as we go on, but, you know, bright light exposure early in the morning is really important. Getting outside, uh, during the day, even for short periods is important. Ideally, if you can get an hour outside, that's great. If not, then you need to get uh, near a window and, and be exposed to daylight. Um, having a bedtime routine is really important. Um, making sure your meals not consumed late at uh, in the evening is important. Uh, reducing caffeine, reducing um, if you're a smoker, hopefully you're not, but if you are a smoker, uh, nicotine acts as a, a stimulant. No alcohol um, before bed because it has a rebound effect. And if you are taking medications, taking them at the same time because some medications interfere with sleep as well. So decreasing arousal mechanisms is important. And then I usually add in another layer of relaxation. So that might be doing a body scan, for example, and uh, working on that for the next week or so. Um, and then the third uh, stage is if people are, once we have some of those base um, basis established, then we would look at doing, uh, some people call it a restriction, and it would depend on whether somebody has a job that is, uh, that they're working during the day, then it would be a compression, a sleep compression. So what happens with a restriction is, uh, I'll give you an example, we'll use an imaginary client, that someone is uh, on average sleeping uh, five and a half hours uh, at night, but it's, it's chopped up. So they have a hard time getting to sleep. They might wake up once or twice and they may uh, wake up earlier than they want to. <clears throat> I should go back and, and define what insomnia is. Uh, so you, everybody has acute phases where they're not sleeping and then they, they manage to get back to it. But typically people who develop an insomnia uh, have, there's a precipitating factor. So there's something that are, um, arises in their life that causes stress or anxiety, and they have a problem sleeping. And that happens to all of us. Uh, and the difference is that then, then there are perpetuating factors or precipitating factors and perpetuating factors. And those perpetuating factors start to become behavioral. So in order to cope with not being able to sleep, people start to develop different habits. And uh, it might be they are not able to turn off their thoughts. They don't have good relaxation. They uh, are consuming too much caffeine to stay awake during the day. And then those then go on and uh, they become embedded. And so for somebody who has an insomnia, chronic insomnia, needs to be treated, uh, I would be looking for somebody that has at least three days a week where they're having a problem and they have had it for at least three months and so uh, then that becomes a chronic type now i have worked with people who've had insomnia for 20 years um, i've worked with people who've had insomnia for six months the longer it goes the kind of the more time you might need to work with somebody through a cbti program mm -hmm. um, so back to the cbti um so the, the foundation is set and, and then we do what's called the sleep restriction or compression. The, the difference is one, you restrict it and then you start working, extending the length of time, the compression, you actually start working and decreasing the amount of time um, that you give somebody um, a time to be in bed. So uh, let's start with a restriction. So the restriction would be if someone has sleeping five and a half hours a night, but it's chopped up, then we work backwards because people tend to stay in bed longer uh, they're not actually up um, 
or the other time they're sleeping in their bed. So uh, I would ask somebody, what time would you like to start your day? And if they say, I want to start my day at, at uh, say, 6.30 in the morning, then we go five and a half hours back. And that becomes the bedtime. That becomes the prescription hmm. sleep time. And uh, they're not to be in bed before that time. Um, and they are to get up regardless of what goes on for them at six in the morning. And so what happens over that period of time uh, and the first week where people are experiencing that is very uncomfortable. They usually are not very fond of me when they're going through that because it's uncomfortable, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, they're struggling to stay awake because people will nap during the day and they shouldn't be napping. Um, they really have a hard time staying awake until their bedtime, but that's the protocol. If they wake up during the night, um, if they're awake for more than 20 minutes in their, in their bed, then they're, they get up, they go somewhere out of their bed and, uh, because the bed's only to be used for sleep and intimacy, um, and they find something comfortable, relaxing to do somewhere. And when they feel sleepy again, then they'll come back to bed. Mm -hmm. And if they wake up again, then they leave again. So, but they still wake up at the same time. So that sleep drive becomes more intense. And then what we find is that they actually will consolidate their night sleep. So they fall asleep more quickly, their night sleep consolidates. And there's a measurement that we use that's called a sleep efficiency. And once the sleep efficiency is over 90%, so that is the amount of time sleeping divided by the amount of time in bed, that's over 90%, then we start extending their time in bed um, by, it, depending on the person uh, and some other factors, it might be by 15 minutes or might be by half an hour until their sleep efficiency starts to drop. And, and typically, you know, the, sort of the sweet spot for adults is about seven and a half hours of sleep. Now we say, um, a lot of the literature will say, you know, eight hours, but that is uh, an opportunity to sleep. So that's the difference. You give yourself an eight hour opportunity to sleep when you're hmm. having healthy sleep. So you're in bed, it takes a little bit of time to fall asleep. You wake up, it takes a few minutes to wake up. So that's where that half hour comes in. The seven and a half hours is based on uh, sort of the, the amount of time that it takes to go through a sleep cycle. So one sleep cycle for an adult is 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So seven and a half hours gives you, well, I think it's five uh, sleep cycles. And then, so that's what we work towards with the restriction. And then, and then after that, uh, there's prevention. So what things do you do? when you come uh, up against uh, a circumstance where, again, you're not sleeping, not falling into the same habits. Briefly, but, well, not so briefly, Sam, but briefly, that's what CBTI is. Hmm. So it's behavioral, it's cognitive, and it's educational. At the same time, there's an educational component to it. Thank you. I, I appreciate the, the detailed description. And just so I, I kind of un understand the process, um, it seems like step one, which I, I really appreciate because it's, it's low hanging fruit, it's available to everybody, is the basic sleep hygiene story that I think, like you said, is pretty, pretty well known at this point in time. You know, light exposure, decluttering the room, temperature being essential as well, um, being outside, bright lights during the day. So the step number one is very much simple, easy behavioral things that virtually anybody can do that theoretically at least should improve quality of sleep. That's kind of like step one. And then step two after that would be, depending on the severity of their insomnia, kind of defined by uh, not having efficient sleep or inadequate durations of sleep, would be putting them into a program in which there is either a restriction or a compression, which would mean if somebody's on average, and I do want to talk about how you measure their, their sleep as well in a moment, but so they, they might get five hours of sleep a night but they're in bed for 10 hours, then you would switch that and say, okay, if you're only getting five hours of sleep, you're going to be in bed for five hours. And if you want well, to wake up at six, you're going into bed at one, something like that. Uh, yeah, I would say I really um, try to not restrict sleep to 
uh, uh, less than like the availability for the prescription time for um, um. five and a half hours if people are not working. Uh, if someone's working and they have to be on the road the next day, for example, I mean, you don't want people on the roads who are dry, dry yeah. drowsy. So I would extend that to six and a half hours. And then Got it. we would start to compress uh, our seven hours, even depending. And then we would start to compress it. So it might be if that's if there's sleep efficiency is still not great, we compress it by 15 minutes and we would compress it right. again until we get that consolidated night sleep. And then we would start right. to build it out again. Yeah. And then the consolidation is largely due to the sleep pressure that builds up. So as as you restrict slash compress the duration of time, all of the, the physiological mechanisms that build sleep pressure are going to ideally uh, result in more of a consolidation where the, the duration they spend in bed is spent in a more adequate restful sleep. Is that sort of how the mechanism works? Yeah. So, you know, it's a little bit about biology of sleep. Uh, sleep has two uh, components that really drive it forward. One are the sort of internal processes, uh, the biological processes that would include, that are mostly hormonal. Uh, people need to under, un, really understand that, you know, sleep is a function, solely a function of the brain. And so um, there isn't any part of the body that's going to allow us to sleep. And sleep isn't something that you can will upon yourself, right? You can will yourself to stay awake, but you can't will yourself to sleep. Mm -hmm. So um, part of the internal process has to do with our circadian rhythm. And so establishing those early on pieces where with, with uh, the environment and sort of daytime activities right. help to consolidate uh, and, and strengthen the circadian rhythm that allow for the night sleep to happen. So those internal um, biological mechanisms need to, need to be in place. The mm -hmm. second part of sleep is uh, external, and those things are uh, is is basically sleep pressure. So sleep pressure builds during the day, and is the result of um, you know, um, actually, glucose uh, breakdown that results in a, a molecule that saturates the brain um, um, receptors and signals that it's that we're getting tired. And so, mm -hmm. uh, those two things come together, and it's a little bit. There are some other pieces to basically. That's it. The two, there's two processes that come into play. So. Mm -hmm. Building the circadian, strengthening the circadian, and building the sleep pressure, right? Right. The two things. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And and I, I once heard a saying, which I love, that uh, a, a really good night's sleep starts the moment you wake up, right? So really playing into that, yes. your, your sleep being determined by the circadian rhythm is largely determined, in my understanding, by light exposure earlier in the day, uh, temperature both at nighttime and earlier in the day, uh, activity levels, right? So I do appreciate sort of quantifying that there are simplistically saying two different things that come together to create uh, an, an ideal sleep. Right. Um, and in that, that process, I suppose, how, how do you measure the efficiency of sleep? People coming to a sleep lab, maybe that's one option, but do you have ways for them to measure it at home? Uh, yes, this is an interesting area, right? With all the devices mm -hmm. that are available now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, insomnia typically isn't um, diagnosed in a sleep lab. So when somebody, uh, if I get a somebody who is having trouble sleep, first thing I do is is do uh, an intake of them and make sure that there's no other underlying conditions because there, you know, there's other um, medical conditions, neurological conditions that can affect sleep, um, and those. Those people, if if they have like restless leg, for example, restless leg syndrome, uh, if there's possibility that they have a sleep apnea, um, then that needs to be dealt with initially. And then doesn't mean that they don't have an insomnia as well, because uh, 
people aren't sleeping in. So we talked about the perpetuating factors and how people go on to develop behaviors. But those underlying conditions need to be treated first. Those are dealt with in a, in a sleep, uh, in an accredited sleep facility. Insomnia is uh, defined by, we said the three, but three, three, right? Uh, three days uh, for three months. Uh, and, um, you know, over that period of time, there's a, 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 a decrease in, in sleep. But there's also the daytime component. If somebody is uh, not sleeping well, and there's usually, typically it affects their daytime functioning as well. So um, that would be how we would look at insomnia. It's, it's, uh, uh, there are uh, verified tools, uh, survey questions that I would ask somebody to go through and check. And if they, if they had answer to, if they answer appropriately to what those are, then that's how insomnia is defined. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the daytime, it's daytime functioning really that, that also is impaired. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so with that, when you're you're working with people, identifying a if they qualify by the the technical definition of insomnia, or uh, and b the severity of what it is, it's largely done through questionnaires more so yeah. than devices. There are devices, but the one the devices that um, you, know, I, you know, I I personally uh, do not recommend devices. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they can be a, a greater source of stress for people if they're mm -hmm. checking them. Um, a better tool uh, is actually daytime functioning, right? And right. seeing an improvement in daytime functioning, more so than looking at the device and it tells you how well you slept. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are certain conditions where, you know, everybody will go through the, the stages of sleep unless they have narcolepsy, for example, which uh, kind of leapfrogs them directly over into a REM sleep. But otherwise, most people go through the stages of sleep. Yeah. Uh, most people will briefly wake up. Um, everybody wakes up. They may not. They may not understand that they wake up, may not, may not stay awake long enough for them to become fully aware. But as we come out of the dream, out of our REM states, we actually have a brief moment of, of waking and then go back to sleep. Um, it really is daytime functioning that uh -huh. uh, most uh, would be mostly what I would be looking at. And sleep efficiency. There's lots of uh, data to show that people are actually pretty good about uh, determining how long they've been awake during right. the night, how long it took them to get to sleep. Um, Interesting. So, so those things seem to be fairly well accommodated um, with self-report along with a measurement. Uh, so, I, yeah, I'm not a big, I, I personally, I'm not a big fan because I, I, yeah. I do yeah. think it creates more uh, yeah, more stress in checking. Am I sleeping well? Am I not sleeping well? <laughs> you know, I I I I love my devices. Hey, I'm I'm all into the the, the tech stuff, and I did try. I've I've had sleep trackers for gosh, probably six years since they were they were starting to be a thing. And what I what I found interesting is very much what you're saying is there'd be so many days where I'd wake up and I'd, I'd look at it and it would be like, whoa, dude, you need to rest today. Your sleep, your recovery index, all of these, like basically saying I'm, I'm the walking dead, but I, I'm feeling and I'm like, but I actually feel really good. And then there would be other days where I wake out of bed, to get out of bed. And it's like, I need 10 liters of coffee ASAP. And then the, the, the tech device, whatever it is I'm using, would say, oh, your readiness score is 100%. Do something intense today. So the, the subjective experience that I was going through compared to the report I was getting from the device, well, it matched, sure, on, uh, I would say probably more often than not, it matched. There were certainly those occasions where it didn't match. And the days where my device was like, 
get at it. And I felt like garbage didn't feel good and vice versa. So I, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because I really do think that the devices can be helpful, certainly, but nothing quite beats sitting down and uh, going through a little bit of introspection, right? Like, how do I actually feel today? What's my energy like? really feeling like so the the other piece of cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia is around dysfunctional beliefs and attitudes mm. around and um you, you know it's the it's the all or nothing say for example and it might be i you know i looked at my device and it says i didn't sleep well and here we go again and i'm going to have another bad day um, right. Sort of the self-talk that happens around that. And so that part of it is equally important when you're working with somebody to um, have them examine that. And is that actually really true? true? Right. Have you always had a bad day if you didn't sleep well. Well, no, that's not always true. You know, so mm-hmm. it's um, those dysfunctional beliefs uh, and having a preconceived notion about what's what what how I'm going to feel and how my day is going to go and, um, you know, projecting how things are going to be. So that is part of it as well, because um, our thoughts happen first and then our, our emotions get hooked and then our behaviors come in. So totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's this, the CBT, uh, um, uh, layout. Yes. Yeah. Triangle. Thank you. You know, I, I've, I've off and on suffered from anywhere from mild insomnia to significant and massively disruptive insomnia for, for varying periods of time. Um, and one of the things, and I appreciate that you brought this up that, that has helped me so much is those nights where I can't fall asleep and I'm waking up and, and, you know, like at the, at the end of it, I'm probably getting four, four and a half hours. Having having gone through other periods of my life, be it travel or emergency situations, which I'll go a week, two weeks with very, very little sleep and thrive, like really yeah. make it through. Those are the times when where I remember and I'm like, OK, man, yeah, you've got a big day tomorrow. You got a speech you got to do. You got all these really important things and you're not sleeping because you're stressed out. But big deal you know like you're gonna be fine and really taking that pressure off and that that idea that if i don't get my seven and a half hours i'm gonna be useless more so knowing like you know you're probably not gonna be sharp as a tack but you're gonna be fine so i do appreciate that that thing that you said about sort of taking a little little pressure off and not catastrophizing a poor night's sleep so terribly much right and I think, too, uh, this isn't part of the, of the CBTI program, but it's one of the things that I incorporate uh, is, uh, is, is um, uh, mindfulness-based cognitive mm-hmm. treatment, uh, portions of that. You know, um, because sleep really is a window into what other things are going on. And so... You know, mindfulness and um, um, is really a, a tool, I think, that is useful for long-term sustainability of, of, of a good practice, a good sleep mm-hmm. practice, and being able to control your reactions, choosing your reactions, not all the time, uh, is really important. And so I, 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 in my work, incorporate mindfulness into the CBTI along with some things like yoga nidra for those times. Mm-hmm. And what made me think of it was what you were saying about you have, you have a really stressful day or a couple of days and, you know, you have to get through that day and you have to be sort of centered and you need to be a little bit more relaxed because there's things going on. Like I, a yoga nidra is really a great way in the daytime, for example, to be able to get that rest it's kind of that state between drifting off to sleep and not quite drifting off to sleep, but it's really quite relaxing. And so some of those things I think are really important to be able to incorporate too. Mm-hmm. So it's really, uh, for me, working with somebody, putting those building blocks in place along the right. way. Yeah. 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 And you know, that, that, that all, it all makes sense. And I, what I appreciate about it is theoretically it makes complete sense. And practically it's, it's, 
very doable. It's accessible pretty much universally. I mean, there are tons of yoga nidras and, and SDRs on YouTube. And, and what, what's coming to mind now, which I think is a natural segue, is it sounds great for me as an adult to, to sit down and do my mindfulness exercises and yeah. um, make sure my, I'm monitoring my sleep hygiene because, damn it, I have self-control and I'm not going to eat before bed, right? But, but what about kids then? What about when children are having these, these sleep issues? So interesting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, sleep changes across the lifespan. Uh, it's not consistent. Uh, sleep when uh, for a neonate is very different than sleep for a 12-month-old. is different than sleep for an 8-year-old. And sleep, uh, and I touched on this before, because it's a activity of the brain and it because there's also comfort elements that come into play for sleep um, depending on the age of the child and depending on what has led up to a sleep issue um, and depending on sort of the family dynamics and um, you know um, I guess parental um, acceptance of certain um, methods uh, of getting children to sleep would all go into the mix of how a particular uh, family would be consulted to about their child's sleep. So, you know, we use the word sleep training. I, I use sleep training for the first six months when you're working with a family uh, because circadian rhythms really don't become endogenous to the individual and it varies by genetics there's genetic components but there's also environmental components um, don't really come on stream fully until about they start coming in in about three and a half four months and then they become more um, um, strengthened and more rhythmic over the next couple of months. So if I'm working with a family um, uh, with a four month old, it's very different than if I'm working with a family with an eight year old. You know, um, four month old, it's around sleep training. So um, developing a, a pattern between the parent, the caregiver and the infant to uh, around biological sleep times um, to be able to put the baby into their uh, sleep space um, uh, so that they can have an opportunity to fall asleep independently time after time after time. Mm -hmm. So culturally, this has become important too, and it's one of the areas that we're looking at. Biologically, right. sleep is the same across the globe, right? But culturally, how how families practice that is very different. So uh, first order is safe sleep in infants. Um, um, and then after that, the sleep training in those first initial periods so that you don't have to have a sleep intervention later on. Uh, places like, for example, in the United States, we're working with somebody in the U.S. and they, there's a, a, a difference in maternity leave. You know? um, Canada has uh, an excellent program for new moms and dads around maternity and paternity. The U.S. is different. It all depends on the employer. So some, mm. you know, some parents have to go back to work earlier. And for them, they want their infants sleeping through them as much through the night as, as early as they can. And so um, typically, I mean, you can't train the we well, you can, you can only get to the infant through the parent, so it's working right. with the parents, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really a, a finding out what the comfort level is with the family about how they want to proceed, and then there's I can tell you from our last uh, survey that you know we I don't like to use the um, cried out because all infants cry when they're uncomfortable. 
So um, in 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 air in I want to say in, in times where it's imperative for somebody to have their child sleeping through the night more quickly, and the tolerance is there, then that might be an approach um, because that happens more quickly. I I don't have a personal stake in what somebody chooses. It's whatever fits with their family dynamics. Um, Then there's parental, how much parental involvement is somebody comfortable with? Are they, are they comfortable with going in and checking and leaving? Are they more comfortable with staying in the room? Uh, And some of that stuff depends on the age of the, of the uh, child, the temperament of the child. Some, some kids get really angry if the parent's in the room, but they're not with them or they're not able to nurse. Or So, you know, a lot of those things come into play. Um, um, yeah, and I've had, I've had clients where, you know, uh, kids are, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, and they haven't slept a night, an entire night in their own room. So hmm. co-sleeping is an issue. Um, uh, it's it's comfort, and then there becomes a negotiation with the child's involved in that negotiation too right. to get to get them through. So lots of moving pieces when you're working with kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like significantly more moving pieces, right? Like relatively simple as an adult. When, mind you, there's another saying that uh, I think it's Matt Walker. You know that the the sleep guy. Uh, get a sleep divorce before you end up getting a real divorce, right? So certainly as an adult, your your partner, whoever you're sharing a bed with, can disrupt your sleep. So there's that complicating factor. But it definitely sounds like working with children, there are many more confounding factors than. Then with adults, it seems like that's uh, quite challenging. Well, I would say the older we are, the more layers have built up around sleep. So peeling those back is mm. uh, interesting too, but it's different, right? Because you're working directly with the individual that is having right. Yeah. So, uh, however, children's sleep comes together much faster than adults. Mm. So typically, um, you know, typically for a child, sleep can be resolved in, in, I don't know, as short as a week, maybe as long as two and a half weeks, three weeks. Which that's next to nothing. That's a blink, right. basically. Right, yeah. exactly. So that, that, that part of it is, is great because as the practitioner, you know, there's a, there's a, the, the good feelings come earlier, right? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for kids, it's faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate the this this idea of, of it being cognitive. When when I have people coming in to see me for sleep and insomnia, you know, as, as an acupuncturist, I should have a plaque over my door that says, I've tried everything and you're my last hope. Oh, um, you know, like it's it, that that's what I tend to see is people who come in and that's what they say. And my my first thing is, have you really tried everything or did you try one thing? Right. Nevertheless, um, I see a lot of people with insomnia and they're they're just looking for a non pharmaceutical approach that's going to do a pharmaceutical thing. They just want me to put in a magic needle, give yeah. them the right herb that's going to knock them out so they can damn well sleep. Right. And over the years of practicing, it's like, okay, yep, yeah, I, I can I can do some things that are going to maybe give you a slightly better night's sleep tonight, maybe tomorrow. But without these huge things, be it behavioral or some of the cognitive stuff surrounding it, it's like that the, the needles aren't going to be the holistic fix that you're looking for. It is more the the behavioral stuff, right? But right. what I've also found in my experience with, with helping people what sounds like very similar to the approach you're taking um, is is talking about all of the, the, the sleep hygiene and the the stories we tell ourselves is there's there's so many layers like you said there's so many things that are getting people caught up on the the process of sleep. So when when you are working with adults, um, do you dig into stories? Do you dig into sort of any any type of of like deeper barriers? Yeah. So, you know, one of the, one of the questions would be, 
what precipitated this. Hmm. You know, uh, I also find out if there's any familial uh, sleep issues. Right. So if there's insomnia, uh, if insomnia was an issue for the parent, your parents, um, a lot of things that we carry with us going through life are things that we learned in childhood, mm -hmm. things that we saw in childhood. Uh, this is how parents cope. This is how how I begin to cope. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of digging into um, when did it start, and then uh, you know creating those aha moments for people where they come to understand. Oh, okay, I can't do this anymore. I can't. Um, you know, I can't take melatonin at night and expect that I'm going to fall asleep quickly mm -hmm. because that's not how melatonin works, right? But that's what I see X, Y, and Z doing. And, you know, uh, so some of those things, some of those beliefs and some of those um they're perpetuated through through a number of channels, you know, perpetuated through advertisement, right? Perpetuated through discussions, perpetuated when you go into your health food store, or into the drugstore, or and or, or uh, about how things actually work is very different than biologically than how. Uh, we would like them to work. And it is the look for the quick fix that mm. I think is the hook for people. Yeah. The difference is you can have a quick fix. So if you're having a real problem sleeping, having a short course of some type of sleep aid is, is totally acceptable. It's mm. expecting that that is going to solve a long-term condition or a chronic condition which is uh, not realistic and it's actually false it actually creates more problems yeah. and it solves yeah. over the long term so yeah. for people to be able to uh, have a behavioral uh, and cognitive um, tools they can deal with things on down the road like my goal is to not have a client come back. Right? My goal is to have a client come, get well, and move on. And because there's lots of people who have who have sleep issues, and so um, access is another problem with CBTI. There aren't a lot of people who are trained in CBTI, and so being able to access it is sometimes difficult. There are lots of resources um, online. Uh, there's there's workbooks and things that people can work through, and I think you know um, those are really a great opportunity. The library, for example, has workbooks and things too that you can work through. That that if uh, you don't want to see somebody, um, that you can you can actually take that on on your own, and, and it, they're pretty good. Like they're mm -hmm. they're actually quite, and they take you through the process. They don't take you through all the little individual pieces. But some of those you can supplement online when you mention some of the YouTube things around yoga nidra and, and relaxation and breathing techniques and those things too you can supplement, right? right? Yeah. And I'm um, I'm curious too, because a lot of the people who listen to uh, to this podcast, they're they're manual therapist practitioners of some sort, largely massage therapists. Um, and I'm curious if if you've got any insight as to to uh if if hands-on therapies like massage do they do they have any long term effect? I mean, I know for myself, I get a massage, and literally the only thing I want to do is sleep, right. right? But so there's some there's some. I think the evidence is pretty strong saying a massage can help a person fall asleep. But do you know of any th any other thing massage therapists could do to assist uh, individuals who are dealing with insomnia? Well, you know, I would really love to see something around infant mm. massage. And incorporating that as part of, for, for parents to be able to incorporate that as part of right. the bedtime routine. 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, as you were saying, hands-on is is caring, is um, relaxing, is it, it just it changes the energy, and so I think um, for a lot of a lot of parents, it would be a great thing to have some instruction about what is a really effective way to to do an infant massage right to incorporate that as part of a bedtime routine Mm -hmm. um i don't i think if i could get my husband to do that it would be perfect (laughs) Uh (laughs) just a few minutes it's all just a few minutes Yeah. So, um, because it is, it, it, I mean, it is an energy thing too, mm-hmm. I, I believe. So, um, it releases tension. I mean, we I, I, when I go for my massage, and I come out of that, I come out of that experience feeling a whole body different than I did going into it. Mm-hmm. If I could hang on to that, you know, for the for the next couple of weeks, that would be great. Yeah. But sadly, it it doesn't last, and then I, you know, I have to wait wait till my next one. So, mm-hmm. um, but that would be that would be. I think it's a great tool for parents. I think it part of that when I was talking about sleep training. Um, one of the most uh, revealing things in the research is, and that if if a well, aside from timing, because timing is important when, when, when you put children to bed. But the other part of it is having a bedtime routine. We Most of the people that, uh, families that have a um, trouble with their infant sleeping is because, it's not because, but um, there's also a lack of a consistent bedtime routine. Yeah. So the same things in the same order, around the same time, for a baby child to go to bed. And if there are naps, if they're in the, at a napping age, a sort of very condensed uh, routine of that too mm-hmm. is really helpful. So when it's just consistency, right? And 80 20 rule, 80% of the time it's going to work, 20% of the time, you know, you're going to get fussy. And so you might have to work out right. it differently. So, yeah. But and it sounds like the. Yeah, yeah, and it sounds like the same same principle works for an adult. Consistency, like right. just a, a consistency with sleep, seems to be a, a pretty pretty essential ingredient. Yeah, you know we're uh, we're coming in on the hour, so I think this will be a lovely place to tie a bow on our conversation. Uh, they always tend right. to, to fly by, so I I'm really grateful for for the time that we had together. And there's been a lot of super valuable information packed into this conversation. So again, right. Mary, thank you very much uh, for chatting with me about this amazing world of sleep today great thanks so much for having me jess i appreciate it my pleasure bye-bye